All right. Good afternoon to both my Facebook and my Periscope audience. Prophet David Taylor here on this Sunday, Father's Day. And remember what I always say, and that is that you need to have the prophetic word in your life so you can hear the voice of God. That's why a lot of Christians are defeated, and that's why a lot of Christians are broken down. Because God would have told you what was going to happen if you had listened to his prophets. Okay? The longer I live, the more I find that to be true. That God tried to tell us, God will tell you what's going to happen before it happens if you listen to the prophets. Okay? So that's why you need the prophetic word. So I know today is Father's Day. So, uh, so much to talk about there, but I always ask the Holy Spirit, what is it he wants me to talk about? What is it he wants me to share with the body of Christ? Because the point is for God to be glorified and the body of Christ to be edified. So, what the Holy Ghost gave me today was to talk about was a subject called my image. My image. Okay? So what exactly does that mean? What, what, what's the context around that? What does that mean? Okay, well, I release this prophetic word to you. Uh, what Father God is saying to us on this Father's Day, what he's reaching out to us with is this idea of getting the right image of him in our hearts and our minds. So there are many of us that have been damaged, and there are many of us that have been abused. There are many of us who didn't have fathers, or there are many of us who have fathers that were there, but they weren't really effective. And then there are many of us that have had fathers that were downright abusive. The word abuse comes from two words, abnormal use. That means when things happen that aren't supposed to happen, that's when you've been abused, when you have an abnormal use relationship. And so there's so many of us that come with all those different kinds of backgrounds and that different kind of baggage, and all that stuff tends to leave lasting scars. So what God is saying to us on this Father's Day is he wants us to see him clearly. He wants us to know that he's not like a flawed human person. If you had the worst dad you could ever imagine, or if you had the best dad in the world, or if you had anything in between, God wants us to know that he is above man. That he is God. He is not like us. Now, he made us in his image, but we fell. Adam and Eve, or more accurately, the man, the woman, the snake, and the devil, they sinned. And they brought sin into this world, and they corrupted the image of God that was in us. And we all became sinners. Therefore, we cannot use other human beings as our standard for how we judge God as a person. That's really difficult to do, especially when you're young, unless you have an extraordinary amount of faith or character, like Daniel had a strong amount of faith as a child, King Josiah had a, a strong amount of faith and character as a child. So it is possible, but most of the time, most of us get our image of God from our parents or our parental figures or our primary caregivers, and normally the way they treat us is the way we learn how to treat ourselves. And normally the way they care for us is how we begin to measure our, our self-esteem. So in other words, if mom and daddy thought you were just the best thing ever, and they treated you that way, then you probably have a healthy sense of self-esteem. If mom and daddy didn't care about you one way or the other, you probably don't care that much about yourself. And if mom and dad downright abused you, if they downright treated you like like you, you weren't their child, they just treated you in a very uh, abhorrent kind of way, then you've had to fight to try to get some kind of self-esteem in life, and you've had, to try, you've had to fight to try to get some type of normal or some type of equilibrium, and it's probably been a lifelong fight. It's probably taken you decades to learn how to love yourself or learn how to view yourself or learn how to forgive yourself or learn how to get any of those emotional tools in place, and that's all because, try as we might, we tend to get our view of God and ourselves from the first 10 years of our lives, from those formative years, and from our parents or primary caregivers. So what God wants us to know on this Father's Day is we, beginning today, we have to stop judging Him by what we experienced in our childhoods from our dads and our primary caregivers. And that goes either way, because if you had a great dad, 
God the Father is still a better father than your dad. And if you had an awful dad, then God the Father is still a better father than your dad. But the key there is health. It's not just spiritual health. It's mental and emotional health. Because when you feel loved, you tend to treat yourself better. When you feel loved, you tend to be more confident. When you feel loved, you tend to look at life through those, those uh, kinds of frames. When you have been taught how to fail, that's right, I didn't stutter. That's not a verbal typo. When you have been taught how to fail, do you know how to fail? When you fail, you're supposed to take responsibility, learn, learn the lessons, then pick yourself up, forgive yourself, and move forward with the new knowledge. Okay? If nobody ever taught you how to do that, then you will wallow sometimes for years because nobody ever taught you how to fail. Or if nobody ever taught you that you were going to fail. See, God the Father is the perfect Father. He already knows everything there is to know about us. So he wants us to start with getting the right image of him in our heads. Because if we can get the right image of him, the right image of him will then begin to correct all the other misinformation that might be inside of us. And that goes for those of you that had terrific dads. When you say, if I had a good dad, then how does that apply to me, Prophet Taylor? I'll tell you how. Because it's possible to make gods out of your parents. It's possible to worship them so until you think they can do no wrong or you think that you know everything that they did was the right way to do it. And maybe what they did was right for them, but maybe you're in a new generation or maybe you're in a new situation and maybe you need to find what's right for you. But some people feel guilty if they don't do it like, you know, like, well, you know, my dad always did it this way, but maybe you need to find a new way. That's okay. That's not a violation of the parent-child relationship, but if you worship your parents, sometimes you feel like it is. So the place we need to start, again, is with the proper view of God. God the Father, God as our Father. And once we begin to get a healthy view of Him, that healthy view will then begin to course correct inside of your soul. So before we dive into scripture, I just want to say one more thing, then I want to pray when we're going to go into it. The other thing I want to say is be patient with yourself. If you've been carrying a thought pattern or a scar for a while, even if you get healed, it's not just going to pop back to normal just like that, just like a physical scar on your body. Okay? If you get a physical scar on your body, it can take a while. Then it'll get to the point where you can touch it and you won't feel the pain, but the, star, the scar is still going to be there. Well, I stopped by to tell you that your soul is the same way, except you can't see it. So that's why sometimes when you, when you see people, you hit a landmine inside of their soul, like you was doing something and you didn't think that was uh, that big of a deal, and they have this huge reaction, that's called a landmine. There's something inside of their soul that you triggered. So on a scale of 1 to 10, what you think you did was a 2. The way they reacted was like a 9. Well, what's making up for them extra 7 points is a landmine inside of their soul that you can't see. That's what makes relationships so challenging sometimes. Because if I have a scar on my arm or a scar on my cheek or a scar on my back or a scar on my foot, you can see that. And when you see that, you say, what happened to your arm? And I said, oh, you know, I fell. Or what happened here? Man, I had a bad bike accident. Or what happened here? Man, I backed into, you know, a, a really hot stove. You know, the physical scars are easily explained, but the mental and emotional scars. And then if you want to get deeper into spiritual scars, spiritual scars are wounds. They're things that are buried so deep inside the breath of life inside of you that sometimes your personality begins to form around them. So sometimes when you say your that's just the way I am stuff, that's actually not true. <laughs> what happened was you got scarred, you got wounded very, very deeply when you were young. And then your personality formed around that wound and now you think that's who you are. Uh, let me give a practical example. One of the best practical examples I can give you is abandonment. If you were ever abandoned on any level, you have two poles pulling inside of you all the time. One side of you is kind of needy, and the other side of you is trying to shut yourself off emotionally so you don't get hurt. So you're trying to be cool, like, I don't need nobody, you know, ain't no thing, we all right, whatever, whatever. Okay, well, 
you got both of those poles pulling inside of you. That's what abandonment does to you. Because abandonment makes you feel like if they left me, everybody going to leave me. If they left me, I must be worth being left. If they left me, how am I going to count on anyone? And sometimes you can carry that for so long until your personality starts to form around it. And then you think that's actually you. But if you felt loved and you didn't feel alone and you felt secure, you would be different. Can you see it? And that's what makes these things so difficult to deal with because you can't see them. You can't see them until you trigger them. And then when you trigger them, you're going to get this big reaction and you think I did a little thing and they're reacting up here with this big thing. And what is the problem? Well, that's because of some of the scars that you can't see. Okay? So let's pray and then we'll dive into the Word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your God as broken vessels. We come to you, Father, in the name of Jesus, the one that has died for our sin and covered all our sin, but we are broken vessels. We, we are jars of clay. We are imperfect, oh God, and we need you. We need you very badly because we can't even see where we're whole, where we're broken, what's right, what's wrong. We can't even do it on our own. God, so we need you. So I thank you for this word today and ask you to begin to open up your word to us and show us the right picture of you so that in seeing you properly, we can begin to heal and course correct and become the version of us that we're supposed to be because our vision of you is clear and we feel loved by you. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, we're going to start with a very popular scripture a very common scripture, uh, and also this is the place that all new believers should start. If you are a new Christian and you have never read the Bible, or you just joined the church, or you're trying to do some kind of Bible study, and the Bible is not a familiar book to you at all, always start in 1 John, okay? Not the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The Gospel of John is the fourth book in the New Testament. That's what I'm talk not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 1 John. It's an epistle towards the end, back towards the end of the New Testament. Uh, it's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Always start with, start with 1st John. The reason you want to start with 1st John as a new believer is because the Apostle John that wrote that was extremely close to the Lord. He's the disciple that laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper, and he's the disciple that lived to be at least 90 years of age and wrote the whole book of Revelation, and he's the one that Jesus gave Mary to. Mary, his mother. So when the Lord was on the, uh, on the cross dying, he wanted to be sure his mother was taken care of after he left and went back to heaven. So he gave Mother Mary to John. That's this John. All that is this same God. So he was extremely close to the Lord. And I love the way John speaks in his book. He says, that which our eyes have seen and our hands have handled of the word of life. In other words, John was like, I saw the Lord. I put my hands in the scars. I touched him. I hugged him. I was close to him. John was like, I had firsthand experience with the Christ. That's where you want to start when you start your Bible study is somebody that had firsthand experience with the Lord when he walked to earth as a human. And uh, Apostle John in the book of 1 John gives us so much foundation for our relationship with God. So by the way, that's where you want to start your Bible study. If you've never read the Bible before, don't start in Isaiah. <laughs> don't start in Song of Solomon. Definitely don't start in Revelation. Start in 1 John. Okay? So we're going to read 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let, uh, I'm reading out the King James Version. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Very important. Okay, let's focus on verse 8. It says that if we're not loving, we don't really know God, for God is love. So if the Bible tells me that God is something, God is light, God is holy, God is just, God is righteous. When the Bible says God is something, then I need to study that thing that the Bible says he is so I get a clear picture of what it's talking about. And many times that's where our scars come from. The picture inside of you is a picture you got from a human or from your childhood or for, from some folks in church. But we want the right picture according to the word and not according to anything else. 
And I know, I know that's difficult sometimes. I know that's a leap for some of you. I know for some of you, that's the first time in your life you heard that. But that's the place we start to build our relationship with God. And that means all that other stuff we've been carrying all this time is going to have to come out and is going to have to get healed. So the Bible says that if we're not loving, we don't really know God. And why not? Because it says, for God is love. Love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. So those are some very strong statements by Apostle John. He said, "Love is from, we're supposed to love each other because love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. So your being born again is supposed to result in some loving, and your knowing God results in your loving your brother. But if you're not loving, John says that's indicative of you not really knowing God because God is love. Okay? So that being the case, then the next thing we would want to do is try to get some idea of what the scriptures say love is. And for that, we have to jump over to 1 Corinthians. This is another very common, uh, very popular uh, passage of scripture. Now, the book of uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians are what the Bible calls epistles. That's another word for letters. There was a church at Corinth that came out of a heathen or a pagan or a non-Christian background, and they had a lot of practices that were not uh, in line with the teachings of Christ. So they wrote Apostle Paul and basically asked him a bunch of questions about how should we live now that we're saved. That's what First and Second Corinthians is about. Is Paul writing these long letters to the church of Corinth saying, now that you're Christians, live like this. Just to give you some background, okay? So, Apostle Paul, this is Apostle Paul talking. I'm reading out of the NIV version of First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. It says that love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Uh, and there's more in verse 8, but I'll just stop right there. Love never fails. Now, when you read that, I know that I know that cuts. I know that cuts my heart because it shows you how far short we fall. Some of that stuff in there, I'm sure you do. Some of that stuff in there, I'm sure, was a challenge to hear. Okay? But the Bible says, if the Bible says this is the way love behaves, then we can extrapolate from 1 John 4 that this is the way God behaves. If God is love and love behaves like this, then we can say, that sounds like the transitive property from math, doesn't it? <laughs> that God behaves like this. So let's plug in God. Let's say that God is patient. God is kind. God is not envious. Now that was huge. A lot of people fight God because they think that God is trying to take something from them. But God is not envious of us. Why would he be? What does he possibly need from us? So God is not envious. God is not boast. God is not proud or puffed up is what it says in the King James Version. God does not dishonor others. God is not self-seeking. That means the Lord always has your best interest at heart. Because God doesn't need us. What does he need us for? What was God doing to sustain himself before you were born if you think the Lord needs you? A whole lot of people don't want to serve God. And sometimes people that do act like they're doing the Lord a favor. My question is always, what was God doing to get whatever he needed before you came out your mama's womb? And what is God going to do after you die if you think he needs you? He does not need you. Okay? Whenever he says something to you, it's in your best interest. Okay? Because he's not seeking for himself. Because he doesn't need anything. He's seeking for us. So God is not easily angered. God keeps no record of wrongs done. That's what the blood of Jesus is for. That's why Jesus' death was so brutal. So that Father could apply the blood to all the wrong that we do and wipe the slate clean. That's why we have to thank him for Jesus. If you ever come before God the Father's presence, thank him for Jesus, if for nothing else. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and God never fails. So God always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and God never fails. So now you can already see how challenging that is. 
because that is way high. The Bible says that God's thoughts are higher than the heavens are above the earth and that God's ways are high like that. So you can see from us studying uh, the love verses how high God is and how far, how far short we fall. So what we, we're going to do, uh, I don't have time to exegete, exegete all of this today. Maybe I need to come back and revisit this because there's so much here to talk about. So, you know, I'm just kind of introducing this now on Father's Day. But as we begin to study these verses, then we can ask Father God to begin to give us a revelation of himself through the word. For example, it says that love is patient. And if we plug in God where it says love, then we can say God is patient. So then we can go to Father God and say, Father God, help me to see your patience. Help me to see you as patient. Then it says love is kind. So we can plug in God and say God is kind. So we can go to God and say, Father God, help me to see your kindness. Give me a revelation of your kindness. And we can go through each one of those qualities because I promise you, each one of those qualities is a message by itself. I mean, literally, every one quality that describes what love is and how God is, is I could, we could write books on just, just you know, one quality. So like I said, I'm probably just introducing this today because there's no way uh, I could go through uh, and exegete all of these. But, um, uh, for example, when it says that love is not proud, in, in the uh, King James Version, it says love is not puffed up. Okay? And we all get puffed up sometimes. I mean, all of us. The old folks used to call that getting your jaws tight. <laughs> what that means is that we all we all get puffed up. We all get angry. We all get offended. We all get uh, places sometimes where we don't want to ask for help. We all get places sometimes where we don't want to apologize. We all get places sometimes where, uh, you know, we're just, we're just kind of locked up with what we're dealing with. And the Bible says that God is not puffed up at all. At all. So what does that mean? That means that God is always approachable. <laughs> God is always approachable. Once you start to get that in your head, then you will begin to say, well, that means if God is always approachable, that means no matter what state I'm in, I can go to him. No matter what state or shape I'm in, because he's not puffed up, he in fact will open his arms wide and receive me. So if he's like that all the time, then that means I can go to him whatever my state. And I know if you didn't have anyone in your life, like a really good mom or a really stable dad, or a really good auntie, or somebody that made you feel like you could come to them no matter what, then sometimes we get in these zones where we feel like, you know, I can't really talk about this, or I can't really, you know, connect or whatever, because you never had anybody love you through the hard times. Because there are just times in life where life is hard, it's not pretty, it's not funny, you need to be taken seriously. You need somebody to be understanding. You need, you know, HWC to be handled with care. And sometimes, quite frankly, people just drop the ball. There's no other way for me to say it. Sometimes people just drop the ball. Sometimes they mean well. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they mean well. Sometimes they don't really know any better. Sometimes they don't know they're hurting you. But whatever it is, sometimes people just drop the ball. But God is trying to let us know that he has wide open arms. He's available all the time. Can you see that? So uh, again, as I say, there is so much here, so I probably need to revisit this. So I'm happy to, you know, just to get this started on Father's, Father's Day, just to kind of plant these seeds so that we all can become challenged to begin to study love and then to, be, then to begin to see God that way. And so then as we begin to see God with an accurate picture, then our scars and our wounds will begin to be healed. But I must warn you, I must warn you, I must warn you of this. Huh. Okay, think about it like this. If you've got a really bad uh, scar or cut on your skin, what does it do when it's healing? Well, many times it can form some pus, which is nasty, and then it'll scab. The scab is there to protect the tender skin underneath. 
And then once the skin underneath is fully healed, the scab can just kind of peel off. Okay? Well, that's physical healing. Well, I stopped by to tell you, your soul is going to go through the same process. When, this, when, when the right information starts trying to get worked in, the wrong information is going to surface because it's being displaced. So do not be surprised if you go through some real emotional struggles as you begin to heal. That kind of comes along with this. I know that's not always easy to hear, and I know that's not easy to endure. It's not easy for anybody. But when you start understanding that God is patient, maybe your parents weren't really patient with you. Maybe your parents expected you to be perfect all the time. If they expected you to be perfect all the time, that means at least two things for your life. Number one, you are not patient with yourself. Number two, you are way too hard on yourself. Because your parents were impatient. They just expected you to get it. The Bible tells us right here that God isn't like that. That God is patient. So in other words, God will give you time to grow. God doesn't expect you to be in, have a master's degree if you just started. If you just started, you're in kindergarten. God does not expect master's level growth out of you if you just started. Because he's patient. He's going to give you time to become what he wants you to be. But people don't always do that. And if your caregivers didn't do that, then you probably don't know how to do that with yourself. You probably don't know how to give yourself time. You're probably chastising yourself because there's somewhere you want to be and you're not there yet. And you're not, you're, not, you're not letting your soul experience patience because maybe you never received it. So that's what I mean when I say when we begin to study each one of these love components, they're so deep. Each one of them is so deep, they're going to change your life. But as we begin to ask Father God to give us a revelation of Him in these components, then all that stuff in us that's not right, that's going to come out. It's going to come out, and it's going to be some pus on your, skull, your soul. It's going to be some scabs on your soul. And it's going to be painful. But that's part of the healing process so that the right information can take root. Okay? So uh, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. I'm about to wrap up. Uh, if not, I'm going to pray a closing prayer. I'm going to pray to God from the scripture so we can begin this process together. Because remember, I tell you every week, there's nothing that I teach or preach or share with y'all that I'm not dealing with, doing, or learning or growing in myself. Okay? Because that's one of the things that just really confused and angered me when I was a child. I don't understand this, this disconnected kind of thing. Okay? So anything that I'm preaching and teaching or prophesying about, I'm going through it, I'm getting healed, I'm learning, I'm growing, I've, I've already been there, and I'm practicing it in my life. So I'm not disconnected from what I'm saying, okay? All right, so Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We're asking you, God, to show us your patience, show us your kindness, show us your lack of envy, show us how you don't boast or not, puff, not puffed up or proud. Show us, Father God, how you are always honoring Show us how you are not self-seeking. Show us how you are not easily angered, that you're not keeping any records of our wrongs. Show us, Father God, how you do not delight in evil, but you rejoice in truth. Show us, Father God, how you are always protecting, protecting us, always worthy of our trust, and that you trust us, that you always hope the best for us, and that you persevere. You're not going to give up, and that you never fail. And Father, even as we read that, that is so high. That is so high and lifted up, O oh God. That is far beyond what we can do in our own strength. That is far beyond, God. We fall so short of you, O oh God. It's not even a conversation. So I'm asking, O oh God, to begin to give us revelations of your love starting today on this Father's Day so that we can see you and heal, so you can heal our image of you inside of us. And so having the right image of you begins to push out, Father, all the scars and the wrong information, and then we can have not just the right image of you, but the right image of us, so that we might become all that you want us to be. So we thank you for it, and we believe you for it, and we give you the glory that is due your name. And we thank you for whatever kind of father we had, because if nothing else, he brought us in the world and gave us a shot at life. So thank you that we didn't die in the womb, and thank you that we have seen days so we've had chances to make choices, so we thank you for that and help us to move forward with this healing process. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this was a blessing to me. This was a challenge to me. Um, amen. God bless you. God bless you. That word helped me today, too. Uh, my father's gone. I miss my dad on days like today, but I know I'll see him again in heaven. Uh, I was extremely close to my dad. I look just like him, so every time I look in the mirror, I'm seeing him. I sound like him. So, you know, my dad is, is never far from me in thought, word, and deed. So for those of you that are missing your dads today, I do understand. For those of you that have your fathers, bless them, spend time with them. If you don't have a good relationship, then at least thank God that they gave you life. At least thank God they gave you a chance to live because you have a chance to live your life and, and do better. Maybe when you have kids, maybe you can allow God to teach you some new loving ways. And then you can, instead of what you received, you can create something new. And pay forward with your children what God has invested in you. Okay? All right. God bless you so much. I'll be here again my regular time next Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for a live prophetic word. Okay? God bless. And have a great Father's Day.